Hello and welcome to our lecture for Module 6, NAT for IPv4 for Enterprise Network Security and Automation. My name is Kelly Caldwell and I'm the lead instructor at Stanley Community College's Instructor Training Center. I want to very quickly let you know that I go with a just good enough video policy. So if the phone rings or my uh, cell phone dings or someone knocks on my office, uh, I may pause the video and then continue. Or you hear me say, uh, uh, and I may misspeak. But I do um, basically give you the same situation you'd get if you were in my classroom. I never would give you a perfect lecture in the classroom, so I'm not going to try to give you a perfect lecture by recording these lectures. I do want to very much encourage you, if you're watching this and you're not in one of my classes, that you look up and find a Cisco Networking Academy in your local area to take courses, or you look at Stanley Community College for one of your online courses in Cisco Networking. Today's module on NAT for IPv4 discusses what NAT is, or Network Address Translation. We have in our particular world right now two versions of IP addresses. There are IP version 4 and IP version 6. IP version 4 addresses have basically run out a long time ago, so we're out of IPv4 public addresses that we can give out. As a result, we've had to find ways to continue to use IPv4 uh, with workarounds, and that is 100% a workaround for the depletion of IPv4 addresses. Uh, one of the things that you will note is that inside of NAT, it is very important that you are working or understand RFC 1918 addresses. So when I look at RFC 1918, uh, this is the RFC that defines private address spaces and or private IP addresses. Now these addresses fall in the range of 10. 0.0.0 slash 8. We've got 172.16.0.0 through 172. Sorry about my typing, but I do have spinal cord injury hands, so um, I do the best I can with them. And then the entire 192.168.0.0. Slash 16 supernet, which gives you a, a large number of class C's that you can use for that. So, all of these are private addresses. So, these IP addresses are not designed to be routable on the internet. In fact, all ISPs will have an access control list related to our previous modules four and five, which will block these particular addresses from being even used out on the internet. They'll be dropped immediately at an ISP. Unless there are some instances, and the, and the module does discuss it, to where we've gotten into situations where we've actually had to double NAT or triple NAT. Um, there's parts of India where I've heard there's actually five times NAT to get out to a real public address. So be aware there are issues with NAT uh, even running out of RFC 1918 addresses. Like I said, my phone dings. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what NAT is. We're going to talk about some of the nomenclature around NAT or the naming and we will go from there. So let's talk first about NAT characteristics. Make my phone quiet. So again, we are out of addresses. Here are ranges that are designed, divide, defined by RFC 1918. Uh, it's a great little read if you want to read it. A little bit of being a little facetious there. Uh, it's not bad, but it just describes what the, the private addresses are and why they were brought into existence. So we have a public IP address space and we have a private IP address space. And then we have a NAT router or a NAT device. Now, this particular class uses a router. It could be a firewall. Uh, many times it is a firewall. Most of the time it is a firewall actually um, that we use for our matting uh, on the edges of our networks. But sometimes we use a NAT router and then put a firewall on the outside, so it depends. But uh, this works also in the exact same way on a Cisco ASA router and on other, I'm just giving ASA firewall and on other firewalls by other vendors. So NAT is taking a private 1918 address and translating it into a public address so it is globally routable. That is the main reason we use NAT. Now, how does it work? Here's a little video showing that it comes in as a, an internal 192.168.10 and then it gets converted into a global address outside local, which is 209.165.201.1. There are various mechanisms that can be done, such as NAT, NAT with overload, and PAT. 
we'll talk about those as we move forward in this class. But it, the, the big thing here is you've got a private address that's inside local. It is being converted or translated to an outside local, which is a public address. And then it can be globally routed. Now the NAT router keeps a table of the addresses that have been translated. It even keeps uh, a table of, especially if it's doing PAT or port address translation, of the addresses and source ports, destination addresses, destination ports, so they can keep up with all that information so that the traffic leaving and returning returns to the right device, which is very important. Now Cisco uses some, some naming and terminology that is a little bit weird. Actually, it's okay, it's a whole lot weird. Um, and in fact, I wish they just went with inside, outside. Part of this is because they were working under the assumption that you can NAT both ways. Um, for instance, if you had um, private addresses on the inside and private addresses on the outside, or the same address space on the you know, two private address spaces on both sides, you, you join two companies that you would need to NAT between them. So they come up with this terminology and basically there are four types of addresses. You've got inside local and that inside local is the device that has a private IP address from 1918 that needs to be translated. So in our case here, you'll see if we move just a little bit down, you'll see that in this network, PC1, has an inside local address of 192.168.10.10. So a private address that cannot be globally routed. It's sending a communication to an IP address of 209.165.201.1, so outside local. So local, when you say local addresses, it's any address that appears on the inside portion of the network. So it's on the portion of the network that is internal to the NAT device. So an inside local is a private. Now an outside local would be a public address or really any destination address that is part of the packet that's on the inside. Then once translated, you have the source address is an inside global. In other words, this inside address, okay, is what's being translated. So it's the device being translated and global is the global address that's been given to it. So at this NAT device, R2, the inside local private address of 192.168.10.10 has been translated or NATed into 209.165.200.226. So you'll see that's why inside is related to inside. So inside local, private address, inside global, the public address is being NATed to. The outside local right, is the destination IP address, typically a public address. Not always, but typically. And then the outside global is the same address and the public address is just on the outside. So outside is the destination device, inside is the device which is being translated by NAT. Um, the global address is an address that appears on the outside portion of the network. And you see here, global, global. In local is inside. Okay, so inside, the device being translated. Outside, the destination address. Local on the inside portion of the NAT device. Global on the outside portion of the NAT device. Now, honestly, for the most part, you can say inside and outside. Inside addresses, the inside local is a private address. The outside is a public address. Um, the only thing there is when you look out on the outside, the inside global is in fact a NATed address. It's very important that the table is correct because that's how things get out. So when PC1921681010 sends something to the 209, um, 209.165.201.1 and that goes out, when it comes back in, the destination address is going to be that inside global. And in the NAT table, and we'll show do a command called show IP NAT translations, and you'll see the NAT table would have the inside global address, this, being related to or NATed to 192.168.10.10. So it tells it when the packet comes back where to send that on the internal network. All right. So a little bit of weird terminology, but again, just remember inside is the 
address the device being translated. Outside is the destination device. The local address is any address that's on the inside portion of the network, and the global addresses are on the outside portion. So types of that. There are multiple different types of that. I typically go with a little different than what they've had here. Um, definitely you have static NAT. So static NAT, uh, which is uh, one private to one public IP. Then you have dynamic NAT, which is typically, uh, excuse me, a pool of public IPs to private IPs. And unless you um, do it correctly, it's still one to one. So if you have five IPs in your pool for dynamic NAT, you can only allow five private IPs to get out. You can fix that by doing what is called dynamic NAT with overload. And that's a pool of public IPs to private with PAT on the final IP and pool. In other words, it'll do a one-to-one -one until you're to the very final IP address in the pool, then it will actually do PAT or port address translation. And that's our next one. This is port address translation. And this is basically um, one public uh, being translated, translates multiple private by keeping up with ports and everything else. And then you can even do um, one public IP already on an interface to multiple private. This is how you're doing it in your house, by the way. You're doing PAT, you've got a single IP address on your um, router from your ISP, that IP address is then uh, padding your, uh, all your internal addresses into that one external address. Okay, so static NAT, one-to-one. -one. Dynamic NAT, you create a pool. That pool of public IPs is NATing private IPs in a one-to-one -one relationship. When the pool runs out, you're done. If you've only got five uh, public IPs, you can only allow five private IPs internally to go out. Dynamic NAT with overload, still a pool, does one-to-one -one until the final IP of the pool, and then you get PAT on the final IP. And then port address translation, which takes one public and translates multiple or many private addresses into the public. So again, here's static NAT. You got a server on the inside that you need people on the outside to be able to get to. So you're gonna statically assign a, a public address that will be NATed to that private address. Dynamic NAT, you have a pool of X number of uh, addresses, public addresses, whatever they happen to be. And as devices on the inside go out, they will be NATed one-to-one. -one. Now the NAT translation table does have a timer, a timer. And so uh, if all of the addresses are used and then you are eventually uh, the timer expires, it is possible that a, a, you could have a release or somebody did a clear IP NAT translations that would also release all of the, the NAT translations. But the big problem here is if you have more internal devices than you have uh, addresses in your dynamic NAT pool, then those devices will not be able to get out. And then port address translation is when you're taking multiple single internal or multiple internal private addresses and they're all being uh, either NATed to a set or a pool of IP addresses, or um, they're being NATed to a single external IP address. In this case, you can see here where there are multiple different IP addresses doing, this is dynamic NAT with overload. All right. There is a problem though. It is possible that to, because of the way TCP IP works, when a, a, any host connects to an external host with TCP, it, it creates a typically a dynamic source port. Well, two different hosts could choose the same source port. If that happens, okay, and that's what's going on here, you see that two different hosts have selected 1444 as 
the source port, the first one gets to use it as it goes out, you know, in the inside global. Well, the next one chooses 1444. Well, what happens is the NAT device will just bump up by one, the source port for that global address, okay, for the inside global. So what's actually being translated to on the, on the public side, it just bumps it up by one. And as long as it's in the table, when this comes back into 1445, it'll be ported into this 10.2.1444. So that's how it handles if two devices have the same source port and you're running PAT. Okay, so pretty simple. Not a real big problem there. And what are some advantages? Well, big advantage is it conserves address space. And honestly, we would all be using IPv6 if it wasn't for that. Um, there's no way, we've been out of IPv4 addresses for years and years and years. So NAT's the only way we can continue to use IPv4 addresses. Um, there is some flexibility in that you can hide your internal network. The other thing is, honestly, um, renumbering your network is very easy uh, on the outside. So if you change ISPs, because you just change your NAT pool. Now there is, I say it's easy, but there's always the DNS issues to where you know, you've got DNS, especially when you do like static NAT, you don't want to have to put in 209, 165, something, something, something. You want to be able to put in www.stanley.edu. Well, that's being mapped to a public address. So if we changed ISPs here, it would be, we would have to change that DNS entry. So there, it's not as simple as I say, but it does make it a little bit easier than if you had to redo your entire network. It does hide your internal network from people who are trying to break into your network. Having said that, that can be somewhat of a disadvantage because it does uh, hide your internal network in terms of end-to-end -end, um, traceability. Uh, it, it, you don't have it with NAT. Now, you can, depending on how long things have been in the NAT entry, NAT uh, table, uh, it is possible to track back depending on timing, but it still can make it very difficult for that. Um, you can have issues with things like um, IPsec with tunneling protocols, uh, you can have trouble with things uh, like, honestly, we used to have a lot of trouble with gaming services because of that. Now we figured out most home riders now have figured out ways of getting around that. Um, you can get, the biggest thing too is what they call carrier grade NAT is when you are, ISPs have actually become so depleted with IPv4 public addresses that they're using private addresses on their internal networks and you're being double NATed, triple NATed, quadruple NATed or more. Um, so that could be an, an issue there. The big thing here is though, NAT's not going away for any time soon unless we go to IPv6 natively on everything. So again, static NAT is when you've got that internal web server and you need the host to be able to get to it with either an IP address or of course we would do a DNS entry. Um, but you've got this and you need to say anytime a host goes to 209.165.201.5, it comes to the correct router and again, that would be typically based upon DNS, which gets sent to, to the organization that, that owns that particular IP address. And then it would be natted to the internal 192.168.10.254, hopefully not on the inside network, but on the DMZ, but they're showing an inside network here. And it would work the same on a DMZ. It would just be DMZ instead of inside network. Now, how easy is this? It's very easy. Uh, step one, you assign the inside and outside. So I, I do a little sing song, IP NAT inside source static, inside outside. So this is always the inside address, so the private address, and this is always the outside address, the public address. IP NAT inside source static, inside outside. You then have to define your inside interfaces and your outside interfaces. So in our particular instance here, S010 will be inside, because that's where the private addresses are. And S011 would be outside. That's where the public addresses are. If you do not do this step right here, the NAT will never take place. So be aware, you can, it's a two-step process. One, create the NAT mapping, static map, and then you got to define inside outside. And pretty much in, defining inside outside is true for every type of NAT we're going to do throughout this course. Now, if you analyze it, you can see the inside local address is 10. Dot, uh, 254. Dot, uh, excuse me, 10.254. The outside local is 200.254. So this would be if the client 
is coming in to the destination 201.5. Yep, the inside global address is 201.5. So this is being translated into 192.168.10.254. And so the, the router here has a table. If you do a show IP NAT trans, you will actually see it. You'll see here the inside global is the address that you specify. And I'm gonna go back up, sorry for the quick moment here, but it's the address you specified as being NATed the inside global, and the inside local is the IP address that you also put in your command, the 10.254. So anything that comes in to this NAT router to 201.5 to any port would go to 254. Now at this point, you could put access control lists on the router and control and make sure that only web traffic came through or only SSH or whatever you wanted to come through. All this does, all NAT does, it does not control what can and cannot come through. It just says what will be NATed, in other words, what will be translated from a public address to a private address. Again, show IP NAT trans, you can see us where it's actually connected now to a, an outside global. That's during an active session. And if you show IP NAT excuse me, statistics, you'll see there's one static which will tell you that there's been a static NAT command entered on this router. All right, so pretty easy. Just remember that's what you're gonna do for all your external facing uh, hosts that need a, a public address and preferably again in a DMZ, not on the inside network. So that's what I called static NAT in my previous text pad scribblings. Dynamic NAT is where you take and you create a pool of addresses. And here we've got two different networks. We've got the 10.0 network slash 24 and the 11.0 network slash 24. And we're going to translate these. So we're going to configure dynamic NAT. So we're going to go in and step one, we're going to create a pool. So we go in and say NAT pool one. And by the way, this again, the iOS, just like in our ACL uh, examples, the iOS is case sensitive, so if you use all caps here, make sure you use all caps anywhere you're using the name of the pool. But we're going to create our pool. We're going to define the addresses we're going to use and the net mask that will be used. So we've got this pool of addresses. Step two, we could configure an ACL. Now, this is a very important difference here. This is not designed for security. This is simply saying what can be or should be NATed. In this case, we are saying anything that has 192.168 in the first two octets, we will allow it to be NATed. And I'll show you how that gets applied here in just a second. So we've created our pool. We've created the NAT ACL. And if you'll remember, I called ACLs the multi-tool of the iOS. Again, that's because they're used for things like this. Step three, you'll see IP NAT inside source list one. So this is saying anything that matches list one which is the list we created in step two. So anything that has 192.168.0.0, or excuse me, 192.168 in the first two octets, because wildcard mass, only significant bits are the zeros. Anything that matches that ACL, NAT it to a pool called NAT pool one. So again, if this, if you had used all lowercase here and all uppercase here, you'd be trying to NAT to a non-existent pool and it would fail. You wouldn't get any NAT translation. So now we've, we've applied or what I call um, associated the access, NAT access control list with the NAT pool. Then we're going to define inside and outside. So those are still things. So step one, create your pool. Step two, create your NAT ACL. Step three, associate the NAT ACL on the pool. Four and five, set your inside, set your outside. At that point, you've got dynamic NAT. Um, and, but the only problem here is, again, like I said before, you've only got the number of addresses you put in here because you have not told it to do any type of overloading. So you're not doing dynamic NAT with overload. When you run out of addresses in this pool, at that point with this particular type of NAT, the way it's been set up using this statement, the next inside host in line would not be able to get out to the internet. So if you got went past the number in your pool. So here we see again, you've got 10.10 .10 going out. It would be translated to, to 209.165.200.226. 11.10 would be translated to 200.227, and so on and so forth until that pool was used up. 
if you want for some reason, by the way, if you do show IP NAT trans, it will show you that NAT translation. If you wanted, and, and it's not really showing it in here, but it does show it in another section. But if you want to convert this to dynamic NAT with overload, you make one little change here. You add the overload command at the end of this step three. So you do IP, IP NAT inside source list one pool, NAT pool one overload. And that will map one-to-one -one for all addresses until the final address, and then it will start overloading or padding on the final address in the pool. Okay. So again, show IP NAT trans, shows your translations going on here. Uh, you can do verbose if you want to see much more information about the, the translation. If for some reason you want to clear out the, the pool, or the scheme not the pool, but the translations, you can do clear IP NAT uh, translation star, that will clear all your translation tables and then it will allow more hosts to use the pool. And then show IP NAT statistics. Again, you've got that. Or you can do show IP, show running config, pipe include NAT, and it would show you all the things that would have NAT in them, but you would have to make sure that NAT, the word NAT, was in your pool name in order to see this. Now, Pat is simply taking the same concept except for, um, and again, before we had dynamic net with overload, if you put the overload command on, or you can actually overload to a single IP address. So you can actually say access list one permit, and this is your NAT ACL, so anything as 192.168.0.0 on the, in the first two octets. Then IP NAT inside source list one, again, referencing access list one, interface 0010 overload. And that, my friends, is a mistake. That is a mistake in the curriculum. Because if you will notice, they are saying to overload to the inside interface. And that is not correct. That should be 0011 overload because you would want to overload it to the public IP address out on the outside network. So this is incorrect. Make sure you make note of that. I will submit that into the um, help desk also because that is an incorrect. That should be 011. Now the others here are still correct. It's still 0010 would be inside, 011 would be outside, but this should be 0011. And all that does now is it says everything going out to the internet is going to be translated to the address that is on S011. So 225 using port address translation. Now you can do it to a pool. This is what I was talking about. They call it PAT to a pool. I call it dynamic NAT with overload. Um, it used to be called that years ago. I don't know why they started calling it PAT to a pool, but it's still dynamic NAT with overload. So you create your pool. Okay, you create your access control list just like before your NAT ACL and you just add overload to the end of the um, list that associates the NAT ACL with the pool. Still define inside outside, no difference. So very simple. This by the way is, is something that's very important in the real world that you, you need to know about. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. You can read through this, but basically what it's saying is that inside addresses are translated based upon the source address and the source port, and it uses the public IP address and a public port that is, uh, excuse me, not a public port, but also a port to keep up with the translation between the two. Verifying PAT, show IP NAT trans, and as soon as you start seeing the port numbers, you're doing PAT, okay? You see port numbers, it's some type of port address translation, whether it's PAT to a single IP address. This, by the way, I could say, um, this is, I would say, I could look at this and say this was port address translation, more than likely port address translation because it's the same IP address being used for the global address with just the port numbers. Um, it could, though, be dynamic now with overload, but it's, it is a, um, from looking at that, I would, if I was asked a test question, I would say that that was port address translation to a single IP address on an interface. 
The last thing in this particular NAT module is NAT for IPv6, and NAT for IPv6 doesn't exist really. Um, IPv6 was designed for end-to-end -end traceability, 340 undecillion addresses. So um, while they do have what's called a unique local addresses, it's really not NAT. Um, so it's there's there is no native NAT for IPv6. They there's been RFCs for it, but it's it's highly highly discouraged. There is, however, NAT six to four, which is instead of running, if you're not going to run dual stack, and by the way, the preferred method is dual stack. In other words, if you're going to run IPv6, all your devices would run IPv6, and if they still need to run IPv4, they would still run IPv4. But uh, in NAT six to four, you basically have a router that is going to NAT between IPv4 addresses and IPv6 addresses. It's beyond the scope of this curriculum, but just be aware that it's out there uh, if you need to do it. Um, the preferred method, however, is to make sure everything's dual stack and make sure it's running IPv6 and IPv4. And folks, that's it for the module on NAT. I hope it's been useful and I hope you can take this and succeed both in your networking academy classes and if you're watching this just for your job, hopefully it will help you in your, your current IT position. Thank you and have a great afternoon or day or whatever happens to be in your area.